Namaskar. Today I really want to explore the power of the Divine Feminine and the gift that it has for all of us, not just for those of us in female forms, but how the Divine Feminine is something that all of us need to cultivate to, to really express our full spiritual potentiality. And not only that, how it's related to the future of our planet, <laughs> how uh, a, sh a deep shift in values and how we relate to the world and the environment around us is really necessary in order for a vibrant, prosperous future for all. So, you know, in yogic science, we recognize the existence of these two forces, Shiva and Shakti. And symbolically, it's Shiva is representing um, the masculine energy and Shakti, the divine feminine energy. Shiva is pure consciousness, and Shakti is that generative power of the, the whole universe. You know, the continuous creativity, the continuous uh, productivity of all of nature, how it's in a continuous process of manifestation, manifestation and dissolution. You know, but this process of birth, of uh, development, and then a return back to the earth, you know, this kind of cycle of creation. That's all uh, part of Shakti, all part of the manifested part of the universe. And the inner consciousness, this is Shiva. So uh, on a very fundamental level, whether we're conscious of it or not, um, the spiritual journey is one in which we are awakening our own divine feminine energy in the form of Kula Kundalini. No, and it's going on a journey. When that journey up the spine eventually reaches the seat of Shiva, of divine consciousness, of Parama Shiva in the Sahasara Chakra. And when those two enter into union, that's when we experience the ecstasy of divine bliss. Now, some of the highest... Um, states of realization that we can experience as human beings. So I've seen this also in our spiritual path that uh, it's really interesting to see how both of these energies are manifesting in us. You know, that we have to, you know, even like for me as a, as a, a female, as a woman, I find that the spiritual path has both increased, I feel, my femininity and also helped me to awaken and to utilize uh, the masculine energy in a very productive way. And so what are those two energies um, in my spiritual life? Like the, the masculine energy is what gives determination, focus, fighting power. In uh, this path, we call it, you know, tantric spirit. This, uh, feel, you know, this I'm going to overcome obstacles. I'm on a hero's journey. I will, I will uh, be victorious in reaching my goal. This type of determination is fundamental secret of success, and you know it is, uh, it is a manifestation of masculine energy, and you know fighting spirit, kind of warrior attitude. And at the same time, uh, there is the energy of devotion and love. You know, that the relationship with the divine is one of like a romantic relationship with a lover. And that when you conceive of this loving relationship, you know, it opens the heart. When we do kirtan, kirtan with the arms up, you know, and with really wanting to taste and be closer and closer to uh, that supreme being, you know, to feel it as our own. Like when the only thing you want is that, your mind just becomes saturated then with blissfulness. And, you know, those moments, it's like that is the divine feminine because moments of opening, of surrender, of experiencing grace. Uh, there's one uh, teacher who said that in relationship to the divine, we are all feminine. You know, we all are in this position of opening, opening up. And uh, so mysticism, the mystical journey, 
Now, that is developing this feminine energy in us. And without it, the spiritual path becomes very dry, you know? So it's actually, in, in the yogic tradition, you know, even knowledge, you know, having wisdom and knowledge and the path of jnana and the path of karma, the path of action, the path of, you know, action through service, but also, you know, doing action in the world as part of your yoga, these have their place, you know, but ultimately what's given the most importance, what will take you the highest on the spiritual journey is the development of bhakti, the development of love and devotion. It's, I think it's like the, it's like the, um, putting the fuel, <laughs> putting the gasoline into the car, you know, without that you can have a great car, uh, but it's not going to go anywhere. So having, you know, this, this devotion, this, this gives you the motivation. It gives you, and, and it's sweet. No, it's not just forcing. It's sweet. It's an unfolding. Yeah. So this is on the individual level of our individual spiritual journey. How does that relate then also to what I said earlier about, you know, this deep civilizational change that's needed to change our relationship, our connection to the planet? Now, I said that because, you know, for many centuries now, the relationship to nature and to the planet has been one in which, you, you know, not all, I don't want to generalize here all human beings, because I think this is something that has developed more out of industrial revolution culture. I think that, you know, pre-industrial revolution, maybe even earlier than that, if you go back more to indigenous cultures, indigenous cultures were living very close to the earth and with a great respect for nature itself. Often were nature worshipers, you know, but there was a deep sense of reverence for uh, nature and living lightly on nature, taking the resources that were needed, but also having a relationship of regenerating the earth. Uh, when we see the industrial revolution come and as human beings gain more and more mastery over technology and over mastery and domination over the forces of nature, uh, the relationship to the planet um, becomes one more of like a resource, a resource that is there for us to exploit and for to extract, you know, as much wealth, as much productivity as we can, without necessarily thinking about the impact on future generations, um, thinking more short term. And, you know, we've seen now this is this is heading us in a direction that's not sustainable at its current level of how we are taking out more than we're putting back in. And there's, you know, massive uh, damage to whole delicate webs of life, delicate ecosystems. And it doesn't have to be this way because human beings, I, I really believe that we've already developed enough intelligence technologically and uh, the capacity of society to solve most of the problems that we're facing on the ecological, ecological level already exists. But what's missing, what's missing is, uh, is the leadership and the values that our, our society has, because our leaders sort of reflect what, what we consider to be, you know, the highest values <laughs> as collectively, collectively, as a collective society. And, you know, we've allowed, uh, we've allowed selfish kind of materialistic values to dominate our, our lives, to dominate our politics, to dominate our, uh, yeah, our leadership. And so we see, you know, this, we, we, we even take it almost as an inevitability that, you know, those who get into power are going to be like this, but it, it doesn't have to be that way. But we do have to shift what we consider to be valuable, what we consider to be, you know, worthy and wise and uh, and part of this, I think, is really shifting our relationship with the earth, but also shifting our relationship with how we value these two energies and how we see them working and coming into balance with each other, you know, because, um, the, uh, those forces of like more, uh, domination, comp competition, control, um, and, uh, you know, 
secular, technological, scientific type of uh, in rationality as being the most important. Yes, I, I think rationality is extremely important. I wouldn't want the world just to be run off of emotion and sentiment. No, I think it would just be a disaster. So we need the balance that comes from clear, rational thinking, and all of us need to cultivate that. That's not like the monopoly of uh, one of the genders or something. No, this, again, I see these things as something that it's a question of all of us becoming complete within ourselves and also our humanity collectively to become complete because if we have uh, seen, you know, the feminine as weaker, as, um, you know, something uh, that is lesser, then it also reflects in our relationship to the earth, to its productivity, to uh, the cycles of nature. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's leading us in this dire destructive di direction. So I think that um, part of the solution is this uh, shifting of our value system, shifting of our value system on a really deep level uh, in which those of us who are in female bodies also have more courage, you know, to step fully into femininity and to value it. Because even though women have achieved more social equality, more, more political equality, more participation in uh, politics, but also in business and in all levels of life, this is a wonderful thing. I'm glad that I get to live in this age. <laughs> I think that it's allowed me also to express more of my potential than I might have been able to had I lived in other uh, ages with other social norms. So uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, but you know what's interesting is that I feel that even though there are those levels of equality, um, it's still an equality in which the values are more on the level of masculine energy values. So that women, in order to feel equal, often we, have, we measure ourselves um, by the masculine values. Like, oh, are we making, having achievements? Are we competitive? Are our careers and like this? Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the other aspects of our lives that might be more related to our feminine energy, more about nurturing, caring, uh, emotional richness and life, uh, connectedness, social bonding, um, these things might seem secondary, you know, caring for ourselves, caring for others. And so uh, we still find ourselves in a, you know, trying to compete, trying to survive in, in, a, in a value structure that's still even even we ourselves are 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 feeding into that. I, I can feel it in myself, and I, I can see how it played out in in my life and in the life of uh, my family in a way. Because uh, I was born um, as a bit of a surprise, a little bit too early for my mom. She was quite young; she still hadn't finished university, and so she wasn't fully, I think, ready, you know, for this life change. But you know, she had the courage to give me the gift of life and to uh, move forward with that. And she was a child of the 60s, you no? Know? So she was also, at the same time, you know, uh, in a generation that was taking on, you know, more freedom politically, et cetera, more, more a different type of um, relationship to gender roles, wanting to go beyond just stereotypes. And my mother was choosing to ultimately be a stay-at-home mom and to, you know, most of her life focused around her family and us. And yet, uh, I had the sense, and this was not something expressed, but I had the sense like there was some feeling of, oh, it's not good enough. No, like, uh, not because any of us felt that way, but just like, oh, you know, to be a real person, to be a real grown up, you have to have a career, you have to be working, you have to be making money. Like, if you're not making money, you're not a real person. And she didn't need to. My father was, you know, quite happy with her being uh, the mom and, and at the same time, very supportive if she wanted to, you know, have a career. Both ways were okay for him and for all of us. Um, but there was some, I don't know, some feeling of like, like, potential that that hadn't happened and on some 
deeper level, deeper dynamic, I think I also internalized a feeling that, oh, you know, if I hadn't come along, maybe she would have fully expressed uh, her potential. And so there might have been an association like, oh, you know, if I become a mother, I won't, I won't do that. So I remember, you know, one time I, I had a, I was in high school, I had a job uh, with one of my best friends, we were working in a frame shop framing pictures. And my boyfriend came and uh, we were very much in love, you know, and at first love, all of that excitement. And the owner of the shop was being very chatty and, and a little bit too curious, maybe. And she was being, you know, pushing me a bit and like, oh, you know, and then you'll get married. And like this, I'm like, what? Why would I want to do that? <laughs> Why would I want to do that? This idea of like marriage, motherhood was just like something I just really like very visceral level had already rejected and and I didn't know why now maybe it was you know some kind of uh, um, anticipation or sensing already that I had a different destiny which I did um, but uh, yeah I think that part of this reaction was like no I want to be you know I want to fully express my potential and somehow seeing that oh that would mean I have to compromise I have to sacrifice so I was falling into that paradigm you know of like of just thinking of, of uh, motherhood or these this part of femininity as being lesser, you no, know? and that you know you have to achieve, you have to you have to have uh, success and career and all of these things. So um, it's interesting because there's a saying that you know you find your destiny on the path you take to avoid it, and so <laughs> even though I ended up choosing a very unconventional uh, path for. You know, not, not many women, I think, decide to become yogic nuns. Uh, it's not something that was on my radar, that's for sure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in the end, I my first posting was in a nursery where we had like 20 little babies, you know, from zero to three years old. And I changed my fair chair of diapers <laughs> in those four years that I was there. And, uh, and I learned to really love babies, you know, and to really be fascinated with their growth and their development and all of these things and, you know, develop some comfort and, and expertise even in the field. And then I went on to Romania, where I am still 18 years, you know, of working also with supervising a children's home where we have, you know, children. When I came, some of them were already t teenagers. And so over this uh, period of time, I've raised <laughs> or been part of raising three generations of kids third generation now are becoming teenagers so you know I got also my fair share of dealing with teenagers <laughs> so somehow you know even though I didn't end up having biological children I really had to uh, um, yeah learn how to embody and how to embrace the maternal qualities of of helping you know a child to develop their potentials helping them to grow helping them to um in in case of many of the kids i've worked with also to heal from from the past and uh and that's a journey that i feel really matured me you know really helped me to gain a lot of uh, wisdom and experience from life so i'm really grateful to that experience and i feel it's helped me to become a more whole person uh, because that part of myself that I think I sort of rejected, I integrated. And I really, you know, during that process, I think like many people, when they become parents, that's when they really, really are able to value and appreciate and recognize the contribution of their own parents to their lives. And similarly, I think it was these experiences where I really drew on, you know, what I'm thinking of, uh, you know, I don't know, kids coming and not remembering that I exist until they're in a crisis and need money, which has been happening a lot recently. And, uh, and yet I think about how generous my own parents have always been, how supportive they've always been. And so, you know, I feel this sort of then duty to be able to live up to the same type of uh, level that I received and to give that also as best as I can. And uh, I remember also, you know, before my father died, just being like, wow, you know, you were amazing because even though you had you had such a busy career and so many commitments, you still always found time to spend with us. And that's amazing, you know, because I now get so busy and yeah, it's not easy to, to, uh, to separate myself from all my work commitments and make time to spend with, with the kids. Uh, I'm not as good at it as my father was, I think. But I really, you know, I really 
was able to have been able to appreciate their contribution and to really understand in a much deeper way uh, the value of um, the time you know that they that they spent with me and how important that was for my own completeness and development as a human being and so also you know recognizing that yeah my mother being so present for us in our lives because she wasn't running off you know balancing a career and doing other things that she was really present there for us and she was really there to support us to listen to us and somehow it just I just feel so sad sometimes that society or that even she was able to think like that she's not doing something because she doesn't have a paid job because this is really work also. It's so fundamental, I think, to creating, you know, human beings that are really well integrated and balanced when they've had that nurturing and that energy. And so, you know, I, I, I would love to see a society in the future that really values that contribution that women make um, and even, you know, financially supports women who, or men or men, whoever is taking on this uh, commitment and role to really nurture children, to really give them everything they need to develop solid personalities. It's such a service to humanity, you know, uh, to have children that are uh, well-balanced, grounded human beings because they have received a lot of love and protection and nurturing care. So, you know, uh, that's another thing to see a more whole, healthy society. Uh, how can we reconceive of what's important, you know, and what, and, and to give it value in society, not just lip service value, but actual value, you no, know? actually see it as, as contributing in an important way to the health and to the future of our, of our society. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I think that cultivating the, the divine feminine, you know, it's, it's uh, part of uh, our individual journey as spiritualists. And also as a society, it's, it's bringing balance. Now, our, our spiritual master talked about society as a bird that has two wings. It can't fly with only one wing. It needs both wings to be strong. And so, you know, the issues, women's issues, <laughs> you know, creating really valuing fe the feminine, valuing women, valuing men, and having a good coordinated cooperation, not a subordinated cooperation, but a good coordinated cooperation between equals. This doesn't mean equal in that we have to be the same, to do the same things, but that there is equal respect for feminine energy, feminine values, and for masculine energy, masculine values, and both are seen as integral, as part of becoming whole on the individual level and on the social level. And, uh, and for this, it's not just women that, it's not just going to benefit women if women have uh, stepped more into their full powers, really step more into um, embracing their own feminine energy uh, as well as their masculine energy. But that this is something that benefits all of society, that it's not just, you know, the, the helping women to express their full potential makes our entire society stronger and, uh, and more free and um, happier, I believe. So we need to be allies to each other. This isn't a competition, you know? And I don't think that the, the, the solution to the world is just necessary that uh, valuing feminine energy, valuing feminine values means that, you know, women, if they, if they uh, are the only leaders, are going to solve, be the saviors of everything. Because women can be just as competitive, just as aggressive, just as, um, you know, uh, dominating as men can be. <laughs> and men can also be, you know, can be overly sentimental, uh, indecisive, you know, there can be other issues that men have. These are not the exclusive monopoly of men or women. No, it's about wholeness. It's about developing this balance inside of each of us. And, uh, and for society as well, it's about um, not just who is in power, but what kinds of, how do we um, value both 
the nurturing, loving side of our human existence and the determined, courageous <laughs> uh, side of our human existence. How do we integrate these two so that personally and as a society, we can really achieve our potential. Our potential relationship to the earth can be one not of exploitation, but one of regenerative, you know, contributing more to the earth than we take out, helping uh, to create vibrant ecosystems, designing things in intelligent ways that mimic the laws of nature so that we create productivity, we create abundance. We can do this. <laughs> I look forward to that type of future. I think that spiritual practice is something that helps us individually to really achieve that. So it's not just some abstract, you know, kind of intellectual idea, but it's something that we're actually cultivating every day when we do our spiritual practices, because spiritual practice requires both. It requires both the devotional love and it requires also the determination and the, and the kind of hero's journey. So I wish you well on your own paths of integration and wholeness. Namaskar. Namaskar. I don't even really know how to express how grateful I am for all of those of you that are working behind the scenes with your donations, with volunteer work, with professionalism to really make the Meditation Steps project successful and uh, reach this vision that we have of bringing the tools of meditation, the philosophy that underpins it, the lifestyle practices, you know, to as many people as possible for free all over the world. So it's just a big honor to be part of it and it wouldn't be possible without uh, the support. So you can find more about how to join and how to be part of this vision. And if you're feeling the benefit of these practices, of the philosophy, um, let's work together to get it to as many people as possible. Find out how you can do that below in the description and there will be some links there. And uh, I hope that together we can really transform this world with uh, a flood of compassion, love, and inner peace that comes from meditation. Thank you.